Genesis 1 is derived from the priestly source where God is known as Elohim or El Shaddai. And there's God in the singular and there's gods in the plural. And I suppose that's because it seems that if you analyze the history of the development of monotheistic ideas, that monotheism emerges out of a plurality of gods. And as I mentioned, I think it's because the, the gods represent fundamental forces at minimum, and those fundamental forces have to be hierarchically organized for, with, some, with something absolute at the top, because otherwise they do nothing but war, right? You have to organize your values hierarchically or you stay confused. And that's true if you're an individual and it, it, it's true if you're a state. If you don't know what the next thing you should do is, then there's 50 things you should do, and then how are you going to do any of them? You can't. You have to prioritize. Something has to be above something else. It has to be arranged in a hierarchy for it not to be chaotic. And so there's some principle at the top of the hierarchy, and maybe the organization of the gods over time. That's the battle of gods that Mircea Eliade had talked about. And if you're interested in that, you could read A History of Religious Ideas, which I would really recommend. It's a three-volume book. Um, it's, it's actually quite a straightforward read as far as these things go. And, Eliade does a very nice job of, of describing how and even why polytheism tends towards monotheism. Even in polytheistic cultures, there's a, a strong tendency for the gods to organize themselves in a hierarchy with one god at the top. In a, in a monotheistic culture, in some, in some sense, all the other gods just disappear across time and there's nothing left but the top god. But even in a polytheistic society, there's a hierarchy of power among the gods. The first story is newer than the second one, so the story I'm going to tell you today is actually older than the one I already told you, even though their order was flipped by the redactor, who's the hypothetical person or persons who edited these stories together. And We don't know exactly why he or the committee, or what I suspect it was a single person, but who knows. We don't know why the stories were edited together in the order that they were edited together, but we could infer, I mean, they were edited together in that order because the editor thought they made sense that way because that's what an editor does, right? An editor tends to take diverse ideas and then to organize them in some manner that makes sense. And part of the manner that makes sense is that you can tell them to people and the people stay interested and you can tell them to people and people remember them. That's, that's one of the ways you can tell if you've got an argument right because it, it, it's communicable and understandable and memorable. And so he, this person was let's say, motivated by intuition to organize the stories in this particular manner. So the second, the Yahwist strand, contains the stories, the classic stories in the Pentateuch, that's five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which we'll try to get through, perhaps, in these 12 lectures. We'll see, we'll see how that goes. It's strongly anthropomorphic, so the God in the Yahwist account is, for all intents and purposes, a sort of meta-person. Um, and I dealt with that a little bit last week because people tend to, you know, think of that as unsophisticated. But when you think that the, the mind, the, the, the ground of consciousness is the most complex thing that we know of, then it's not so unsophisticated to assume that the most complex thing that there might be is like that. Or it's, at least it's as good as we can do with our imaginations. And so I don't think it's so... It's so... Uh, it's so unsophisticated. It's also the case and this is practically speaking, is that it is not at all unreasonable to think of God the Father as the spirit that arises from the crowd that exists into the future, right? And that's, we talked about that in relationship to the idea of sacrifice, at least a little bit, or, or we're going to. You make sacrifices in the present so that the future is happy with you. And the question is, what is that future that would be happy with you? And the answer to that is, it's the spirit of humanity, that's, that's who you're negotiating with because you make the assumption that if you forego impulsive pleasure and get your medical degree, that when you're done in 10 years and you're a physician, humanity as such will honor your sacrifice and commitment and open the doors to you, right? So you're treating the future as if it's a single being and you're also treating it as if it's a, some, something like a compassionate judge. You're acting that out and maybe we had to imagine God in that form before we could understand, once we started to understand that there was a future, perhaps we had to imagine God in that form in order to concretize something that we could bargain with so that we could figure out how to use sacrifice to figure out how to guide ourselves into the future. Because a sacrifice is a contract with the future. 
But it's not a contract with any particular person. It's, it's a contract with the spirit of humanity as such. It's something like that. And so when you think about it that way, that should make you faint with amazement because that is such a bloody amazing idea. To come up with that idea that you can bargain with the future, that is some idea, man. That's, that's like the major idea of, human, of humankind. We suffer, what do we do about it? We figure out how to bargain with the future. And we minimize suffering in that manner. It's like no other animal does that either, you know? Like lions, they just eat everything. I think a wolf can eat 40 pounds of meat in a single sitting. Right? It's like, there's some meat, eat it. It's like, not like, save some mammoth for tomorrow. That's, a, that's, that's not a wolf thing, man. That's a human thing, and that might mean you have to be hungry today. Or maybe you're a farmer, you know, several thousand years ago, 6,000 years ago or so, when agriculture first got going, and you're starving to death, waiting for the spring planting, and you think, we bloody well better not eat those seeds. Right? And that's really something, to be able to control yourself, to make the future real, to put off what you could use today, and not just in some impulsive manner. Man, maybe your kids are starving to death. You think, we are not touching the seeds that we need for the future. And for human beings to have discovered that, and then to also have figured out that we could bargain with the future, it's like, man, that's something. And I think that, that, I think that the stories that are laid out in this book actually describe, at least in part, the process by which that occurred.